Spotlight, lectures and performances on and around Albany State University. Hello, thank you for the, the warm welcome and it was good to see friendly faces that I, that I knew from last summer. I will talk about the NSF REU program or research experience for undergraduate program that Dr. Manduma and his students were involved with at the end of the talk. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of information about that. Uh, what I'm going to talk predominantly about today is going to be about the research that I do. And one of the things that hopefully will, I will impress upon you is that I'm going to show you data. I'm going to talk you through the data because it's stuff that, uh, that most people don't think about on a regular basis at all. And so we're going we're gonna to take a close look at it. But everything done up here except for one small portion of one experiment was done by undergraduate students. Okay, so everything that I show you here was done by students just like you sitting in the, in the seats here. So everything is absolutely doable. And I'm going to give you a fair amount of background on what we, on what we do. Okay, the other thing I would say, if you have questions in the middle, just pipe up, raise your hand. I'd be happy to stop. I am a teacher at heart, so I'd be happy to stop and explain anything or, or go into anything in more detail if you are interested. Okay. Uh, as I said, I am at Furman University. It's in the upstate of South Carolina, so while it feels like a coastal state, uh, it's a long ride to the beach. Uh, sometimes it's a little sad, but uh, we are close to the mountains. So most of my research focuses on the molecule of DNA. Okay, and so this is the chemical structure or portion of the chemical structure of DNA. What I want you to, to look at is you have those four bases that you've learned about for a long time, A, G, C, and T. Those have a specific chemical structure. They have lots of nitrogens in there, so they're called nitrogenous bases. And then you've got the backbone. It's got a sugar, okay, so it's not tasty, but it does have a little bit of sugar in it. And it has a phosphate here. And that phosphate is negatively charged. So this is basically a big negatively charged structure. Okay? And so that's what this is. And we know that that all comes together to form. Oh, should I stay close to that or away from that? Probably away from that. OK. So um, if you put that structure together, you can look at it in a different view. You can look at it in three dimensions. And so this is the classic DNA structure that we see in a lot of places. In fact, you even see it on L'Oreal commercials. You see the picture of, of DNA floating across the, the screen. In fact, one of the things in my pet peeves, DNA has a specific handedness. So if you take an organic chemistry, you know that you have right handedness and left handedness. You have chirality. DNA is right handed. Okay, so it is a right handed helix. The DNA that they show you in those commercials is left handed. It's fundamentally wrong. That's my little pet peeve about what's going on with. Uh, with those beauty commercials, but it's still cool to see my favorite molecule there. And so this is what DNA looks like. This is just two different ways of looking at the same exact thing. One, you can see the bonds. The other one, you can see where the space that all the electrons fill. And what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at proteins and small molecules that interact with DNA. They form different types of interactions with DNA. And oftentimes, they bind. Where they bind is in this little groove between the red the two red strands, and that's called the minor groove of DNA. So it's the space between the backbone, so if you remember back to the last slide, you have the backbone, which is where we have our negative charge and our sugar, and they just sit right in that groove, okay? And so that's what we're going to look at in a little bit. What we're trying to do is we're trying to control gene expression for good, okay? So we're trying to understand uh, how we can control it, and so first we have to understand the idea of a gene. The gene is the fundamental unit of heredity. It's what you pass from one generation on to the next so that your children look like you and act like you. You look and act potentially like your parents. And so you have that. It is that order of sequence of nucleotides, that A, G, C, T. You could have a whole bunch of A's in a row, G, A, C, all of that. That makes up who you are, okay? what you, uh, makes up a lot of what your own biology is. And what these do is they encode for things that function inside your body, proteins and RNA that do the job. They're little machines in your body that work around within your body making sure that your heart beats, okay? Making sure that you can digest the food that you're gonna eat for lunch and all of that. And so what we're gonna do is we look at their function. And that genomics includes regulating gene expression and understanding how that, how 
how that works. Okay? And so what is that link? I said there's a functional, these, these RNA and these proteins have function. You have the DNA at the core. This DNA, whenever you need new cells, you get new DNA. That's done by a process called replication, enzyme called polymerase. But the DNA ultimately encodes for RNA. This RNA is processed to more complicated RNA. Ultimately, you make protein. So this is what is known as the molecular dogma of biology. It's how you work. It's how your genes turn into things that function. What we're going to focus on is the level up here, is how do we control that? And there are things called transcription factors that either make sure that you go along this pathway to producing proteins, or you stop, maybe you don't need that protein, and you keep it from happening. And all of that is controlled at the DNA level by proteins called transcription factors. So let's zoom in even further. Let's look at that DNA. Okay, so you have this DNA. You have a gene, and then you have regions uh, associated near that gene, okay, that control whether this gene is on or off. So let's look at this here, and we call those regions promoters. So you have a protein. You actually have lots of proteins, but let's say you have one key protein that comes in and it binds here. And because it binds, you get that RNA. So that pathway that you saw on the previous slide, you're starting to march down that pathway. You express the gene because you've made a protein. You might have other transcription factors that because they bind, they turn it off, okay? And so this might be a different gene, and you turn it off, and that gene is not expressed. You don't make that particular protein. So all of that is controlled. So whenever we say a gene is on or a gene is off, we are typically talking about specific proteins that control whether that is on or off. Okay? But there is a problem with this sometimes. Okay, so sometimes this can go awry in a healthy system, in healthy humans. This is working perfectly fine and perfectly normally, but sometimes there's a problem. Sometimes you don't want this to happen and you get a deleterious cellular function. Okay, that's a fancy way of saying something has gone horribly wrong. What typically this might correspond to is cancer. Okay, so this can correspond to cancer where what you have done is you have this that's not supposed to be here and it's turning on the gene and it's causing things to happen inside the cell that aren't supposed to happen, okay? Maybe they meant to, were supposed to at some point, but they're not supposed to happen anymore. And so this is what my lab is focusing on. We're focusing on trying to understand how to inhibit or how to develop compounds for down-regulating or, or, or targeting cancer. And so this is what we do. We have a small molecule and we can kick off that protein. There's a, there's a rule in, in, in any sort of system that you can't have two things bind to one spot at the same time, okay? And that's what we're taking advantage of here. If we bind this small molecule to the same site where we want this transcription factor to bind, then we can hopefully shut down transcription and we shut off whatever is linked to that cancer, okay? And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to control gene expression in a good way in order to fight a disease we look at that we can look at that at a more molecular level okay and this is just a cartoon of DNA and there are a couple ways in which you can ha develop small molecules to bind to DNA they can either bind into that groove so remember I point out the grooves in those three-dimensional models so you can bind something in there alternatively you can bind between the base pairs it's called intercalating so if you have something that binds between your base pairs, so it's sliding sort of horizontally through the system you can do that. You can also have something bind in the major group, but you can develop all these small molecules. Yes. We can use this to our advantage. Proteins use very similar ideas also. They're just bigger and more complicated. And so we have these wonderful array of small molecules that are out there that can do this job of kicking off proteins. So this is that bottom part of the two slides ago. And they have fancy names like actinomycin, ethidium bromide, mithromycin, DB75. Have you guys heard of ethidium bromide? Uh, has anybody heard of it? We use that if you run gels. So if you've done gel electrophoresis, this is the classic agent that binds to DNA and fluoresces so you can see your DNA in a system. The problem is, and why a lot of labs mo have moved away from this, is because it slides between those base pairs or intercalates, it's a carcinogen. Okay, so we also have to be careful. We're talking about things that could kick off proteins, but we also at the same time have to be careful 
not to develop carcinogens that might cause cancer themselves. That's the definition of a carcinogen is something that causes cancer. Okay? But it binds to DNA, so we need to be careful. We don't want something to bind so well. Okay? Mithromycin and actinomycin, those are massive molecules. You don't even, this has a huge uh, carbon um, amide structure that's going on up there. These are both big mo molecules. These are made by bacteria. Okay? So both of these are, are generated naturally. And it's part of what bacteria do to defend against other bacteria or to defend against other things that might invade their space. So bacteria are very possessive of the space they live in. And so they generate chemicals in order to keep bacteria from living in their space. Well, humans, we have sort of taken that. We, we take those bacteria, we isolate chemicals from there, and we can use that for our own to help us fight against various things. And so that's where these have. This DB75 has been, was developed up at Georgia State, so up in, up in Atlanta, and it's very promising as a, a, a precursor for fighting African sleeping sickness. So that's uh, from the, the tsetse fly, if I remember correctly, that uh, it injects you with a parasite. And so while it sounds not so bad with sleeping sickness, it is actually quite deadly and is, uh, and is a, a huge, um, drain on, on societies that have this. And so this is a very promising uh, pathway for fighting a, a very dangerous disease. And so we can look at these types of small molecules for inhibiting proteins from binding the DNA. And so people are doing that. I'm not alone in doing this kind of thing. And so you can design these. They have all sorts of, so part of what that slide shows you is you have lots of different structures. You have lots of different ways in which these molecules look. And what big pharmaceutical companies do is they make a lot of these. They have huge arrays, 10,000, 100,000 of different molecules out there. And basically they look at it, they say, ah, does this do what we want it to do on a small scale? Then they skip all the way over here and start testing it in small animals. And, and then if that works, they start bringing it up in humans and, and so forth. And they've got a giant army in which to do that. It's hard if you're working in a small academic lab to be able to do that yourself. And so what we can fill in are these two black boxes, OK? What we can do is start to understand more about how this works on a molecular level. And so I see two black boxes. I see one which is biophysical interaction, so what is happening at the molecular level, as I said, and one that's more cellular in scope. And I'm a chemist. And so this is where, where the red circle is. That's where I focus my attention. The goal is, is if we understand this at that level, we can better help the big pharma companies or other people make that leap. They can help to design better drugs. We can design better drugs also. Okay. So we have an array of possible small molecules out there. We're trying to do that. Then what we looked for was a way, a system that would, that would be good to, to understand. And what I focused on was something called HMGA1. It stands for high mobility group A protein. That name means absolutely nothing with regard to its function. High mobility group, for those of you who have done gel electrophoresis, basically means it moves fast on a gel. Okay? So it has nothing to do with its function. All it is is it has high mobility. Okay? And this is a cartoon of what that is. So this gray box here is DNA. In orange, we have the protein. And so our goal is, is to take these small molecules presented, represented by blue here, kick off that protein, and now they're bound to the DNA. And hopefully we have altered our gene expression. This protein has three regions that bind to DNA. We call them the AT hooks. So remember AT hook or ATH. Sometimes you will see it referred to as ATH. And this is the structure. What I really want you to pull out of this, it has a lot of positive charge. In fact, it has uh, key positive charges right here. It has a lot of flexibility here. And so it binds within that minor group of DNA. We only have part of a crystal structure. In fact, where our NMR structure, we only have structure, we only know the three-dimensional structure of this piece. There's a lot more to this protein, which is why you saw a couple of clicks ago, it represented as a cartoon. That's because 
we don't know much more about its structure. We know what amino acids make it up, but we don't know much more about its structure. Okay. Then the small molecule that we chose is called distomycin. Okay, so much smaller than what you saw in the previous slide, even the little region that binds to DNA. And so it's called distomycin. It used to be commercially available. Things that you can buy are, are better than having to wait on things you can synthesize as a biochemist. So if I were a synthetic chemist, then it would be okay, but I'm not a synthetic chemist. And so, um, so this works well. I could buy this. However, it's no longer available commercially in the United States. We had a few experiments that I'll show at the very end. We had to, just to wrap up something, we had to spend $300 to get two milligrams of distomycin shipped from China um, to the United States, and it took two months to get here. We think it took a camel um, through, uh, through China to, to get to us. But, and it was packed on ice when it started, or packed in these ice packs. So you know those ice packs that you get when you get stuff from chemical companies, those of you who've seen that? Um, that had fried. Okay, that was obviously not cold since it was about two months later and um, had, had, was not good anymore. What this looks like when it's found in DNA, it binds as a dimer. What I mean is it binds two molecules of distomycin for a single, mole, single area of DNA. And so it takes up this amount of space and it actually binds anti-parallel. So, so it binds in sort of opposite directions from one another so that this positive charge is opposite the positive charge on its partner molecule. So if you take my wrists as the positive charge here, my wrists are in opposite ways, whereas my fingers are this end here, like that. Okay, so it binds like this within the, the DNA. What that does is it incorporates again this positive charge. Remember DNA is highly negatively charged, this is positively charged, and so there is good electrostatic interactions. Okay. So that's the system I'm working on. One other thing I want to mention about it, this HMG protein is that it is only expressed in embryonic development and, in, and as you're early on in childhood. It is not expressed in adults, except when, uh, when they're in some cancers. And unfortunately, in those cancers where it is, present, this protein is present, it is linked to cancer metastasis, and that is when the cancer is spreading to another tissue. So this makes it a very promising target that if we can target this, we have the potential to slow down a cancer. One of the reasons that cancer is so deadly is because of metastasis, because it spreads to other tissue areas. If we can slow that down, or even shut that down, we have the potential to, um, to seriously hamper cancer, have other drugs in combination come in and help to destroy it. And so that's what, um, that's our system. We've used a whole lot of different analytical techniques and the ones that I'll, we'll talk about today, I'll spend more time on, okay? And so um, the, the three that I'm gonna focus on here are uh, NMR, so you guys have a 400 megahertz NMR. And so that's what a lot of these experiments have run on. Circular dichroism and uh, calorimetry. We also have other fluorescence-based techniques. And so first, a little bit about NMR. So NMR is how you can figure out the, the three-dimensional structure or two-dimensional structure, bond connectivity, and so forth of, of any molecule in theory. And so you have an instrument that looks something like this. It's a giant, it holds a giant magnet. If you guys haven't run across this, then it's just, uh, it's, it's like an MRI in a hospital, okay? And what you're able to do is look at the, uh, the spin of, and this, everything here is the proton. And so we can look at that. What we do is instead of looking at the entire proton, protein, the entire HMG, because that would be really challenging, we'd have a lot of signals in there, we just look at the AT hook. So remember I said keep a hold of that AT hook in your mind? And so that we're just representing it as, as this little orange sort of um, gnat wings structure. This still is our distomycin that we talked about. Okay. And so we know a little bit about this system before we started. We have binding constants, okay? And so of our distomycin and of our AT hook, what these numbers reflect are how tightly 
do these bind to the DNA or how well do these bind to the DNA? And if you're just looking at just this region and not the big protein, if you're just looking at this, then um, it, it's a smaller number, which means it's a tighter binder. Okay, so smaller numbers are better. So that's one of the things to remember. So the distomyosin should win when you are trying to compete against the AT hook. So what we did is we ran NMR and we looked at it and let's talk, let's talk through this a little bit uh, slowly. So what you have here is you have DST, stands for dystomyosin, that's a small molecule. You have our, our protein or our AT hook here and then the third thing is the DNA. So what we've done is varied how much dystomyosin we've had, we vary how much protein we have, and we vary how much DNA. Well, we don't vary that, that always stays at once, so we kept DNA constant. And so if you look at orange, what's in here is only the AT hook plus the DNA. So that's what all these orange signals are. And what they're representing here is every single base within a 10 base pair of DNA. So we look at a short p segment of DNA, and you'll see that sequence in a little bit. It only has 10 base pairs. If we looked at something bigger, it would get far too complicated. And so you can see all of these, and we don't really care what that number is. You just, we're just looking at a pattern. Now, if we look at dystomyosin, our small molecule bound to DNA, that's the light blue with no AT hook around, then you have these much bigger bars. So the first thing to do is just pattern recognition is that orange looks different than blue. Okay? And so when we use this technique, we can tell when dystomyosin is bound by what the pattern looks like, and we can tell when the AT hook is bound. Okay? That's simply what we're doing is looking at pattern recognition. Once we established that, then we looked at a system that had all of it in there. So we had the small molecule and the protein competing for the DNA. And what you can see here is the pattern looks just like it does when you have dystomyosin bound. Not in between, all right? It doesn't look like it does with the AT hook. It looks exactly like it does with the dystomyosin bound. So that means, first thing, dystomyosin wins, okay? When you throw it all together, the small molecule wins. It's able to kick off the AT hook. That's exciting, okay? That is really exciting information about this. To give you a little bit more information about what's going on down here, you have four base types of bases, A, G, Cs, and Ts, so that's what this is here. Then when the, if you're looking at a proton attached to a carbon, then you have a C. If you have a proton attached to a nitrogen, then you have an N. And then these have specific numbers as you go around the rings, and so that's what the numbers up here are reflecting. And where we see the biggest amount of change is at the A and at the T, okay? What this indicates is that, both, that dysomyosin binds to AT base pairs. It doesn't bind to GC base pairs, okay? So it binds to AT rich, if you will, sequences of DNA. Okay, so then what we did is we did two-dimensional NMR. Okay, so we did 2D NMR, we did cozies and nosies, and here we're looking at nosy. What a nosy is, is you're looking at interactions through space. Okay, so you're looking at whether something is close to something else in space. It doesn't have to be connected by a covalent bond, it's just, hey, am I close to you? Okay, that's all this is doing. And it gives you this very complicated picture, right? I mean, that looks pretty complicated. In fact, when my student first looked at this, these experiments were absolutely done by an undergraduate. He just about bugged out. He said, oh my gosh, you want me to do what with this data? Okay, and by the end of it, he was so excited about what you can do with NMR that he's now pursuing his PhD at UNC Chapel Hill, working as an RNA biochemist, or not RNA, NMR biochemist, um, doing this kind of work on much bigger systems than he worked on with me. And so that's really exciting. And so, again, this is pattern recognition. What we look at down here is we're looking at a system where you have all three species. You have protein, you have your dystomycin, you have DNA, all of that mixed together in one tube. Here, you just have the protein or the AT hook and the DNA mixed together. And what you can see, you look for areas where this picture, this spectrum, and this spectrum look different. And that happens exactly where these orange boxes are here and these black boxes are here, okay? That's the only place where it's different from one to the next. And what that indicates is that when you have dysomyosin around, 
that you don't have this AT hook bound to DNA. These are contexts that are only present when the AT hook is bound to DNA. Those are not at all present when you have dystomycin bound. So we saw the pattern earlier, but now we've proved that these are not bound within their normal site of DNA. Now we compared that same idea with dystomycin. Okay, and so here again we have a mixture of all three together, and here we're looking at dystomycin binding to, uh, to the DNA with no AT hook present. And again, we're looking for patterns, and what you can see as what uh, has squares here, um, we'll talk about that circle in a second, but these squares here is that it looks the same. Okay, so our dystomycin is bound within the DNA as, it, as you would expect. What's really cool about this is that we have on the right there, we have this protein present. It's not doing much to change how dystomycin binds to DNA. So if you were to run an experiment like we did here where you just have dystomycin bound to DNA, then you're seeing what you would expect. Okay, even with the AT hook present. We do get, however, some differences. And so you can see these little dots right here. You don't see dots on the right spectrum. And so that's starting to indicate that maybe this system doesn't behave as simply. Remember I said that they look very similar, okay? But, and we're gonna talk about this some more, is that the AT hook does have a slight effect on how dystomycin binds to DNA. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more. And then finally, this idea is that dystomycin can freely fall off the DNA and rebind and fall off the DNA and rebind even in the presence of AT hook and it's not gonna matter. That's good, you want a drug that's able to dissociate from its target and then win that fight again by binding it again. You want it to be able to fall off and bind and fall off and bind. Okay. Now we, we started to mess with the ratios even more. And so this is the same spectrum that you saw before, 2, 1, 1, essentially. And then now what we've done is just added a little bit of dystomycin in. We want to see with a little bit of dystomycin, what do you get? Okay, do you get who, who wins? And you do see some differences. What you get here is you get a little bit of the complex form between the protein and the DNA. And you get the complex bound between the dystomycin and DNA. But even here, when you don't have a lot of dystomycin, what you don't get is a complex of dystomycin and AT hook and DNA all together, okay? And we get that from the pattern. So when we look at these patterns and compare it over here, what we don't get is some big complex. This is good. And part of the reason this is good is because this protein, this AT hook, if we pretend my arm is DNA and the protein comes in and, and binds to it, it's turning on genes that are downstream from it. So this is what's turning on those genes that are downstream and it comes on here. Well, the way it's doing that is by interacting with other proteins. If this protein, if this AT hook were still able to bind a little bit, it might still be able to turn on the genes that we don't want it to turn on. And so we want to be able to kick this protein completely off. We don't want it still hanging out a little bit, okay? We want to make sure that it is gone. All right, and so this is starting to indicate that yes, that it's, it's gone. It might still have a little bit of effect as I talked about, but it at least you're not forming a complex with all, or a stable complex with all three. But we still have this little bit of, of wondering. There's something a little bit different going on here and is this something we need to worry about? So we switched Nuclei, instead of doing proton, we did P31. So basically now, remember, DNA has all those phosphates. It's rich in phosphorus. And so we can look at that by NMR. And so what we did was we varied it again, okay? 0, 2 to 1, 2 to 0 to 1, 2 to 2 to 1. Again, we're just looking at the ratios. And what we can see here is that these look different, okay? So the pattern down here, when you just have the AT hook present, is very tight. All those shifts are all close together. Once you add in dystomycin, all those shifts separate. And when you have a complex with all three, they're still separated, but not quite the same. And so what this is indicating is what the title says, is that the AT hook is still, because of all those positive charges, it's still hanging on a little bit to that phosphate backbone, okay? It's still hanging on just a little bit to that backbone, and it's affecting how dystomycin binds. 
So I'm going to leave that. I'm going to, ah, sorry, going the wrong way. So I'm going to leave that there for the NMR. So we were able to figure out a lot about structure. We were able to do that. This uh, got published in the journal Biochemistry, which is an American Chemical Society paper. And that was, that was really awesome um, last year. We also have questions about structure. So while that can give us very fine structure, and, and that's very good, we also wanted to get a look at the global structure of our nucleic acids. So we did CD. So we have a circular dichroism experiment. How many of you guys have done UV vis? I can see a show of hands. How many of you guys have done UV vis spectroscopy? Oh, come on, I know somebody has. UV vis? Nope. Okay. So UV vis is a, a, a way in which you can look whether a molecule absorbs light. Okay? So does the molecule absorb light? And that'll give you a characteristic about what's going on. What was that? Awesome. Good. So this is just like that, except instead of just shining straight light through it, you have a polarimeter there and you polarize the light. Okay? And you can either turn it into, well, you turn it into both left-handed polarized light and uh, actually right-handed and left-handed polarized light. And so we go back to the idea of chirality. So your DNA is chiral, right? So we talked about the virion. It has a right-handedness to it. It is chiral. So if you put within your cuvette a sample that is chiral, you will see it. If you put something in your cuvette that's not chiral, you won't see it. And what I mean by that is you will get a flat line in your spectrum, okay? What you can get if you put something chiral in there is you get cool peaks that look like this. And these are just, these alphas and betas and Rs are just indicating different types of DNA. And so you can tell that what it's giving you is a big idea of what's going on with the structure. And so that is what we did. Okay, so let's talk about this little piece by little piece. So first of all, in dashed, we just have the DNA. And so this dashed line is hard to see because it's overlaid by the red line. And so the dashed line runs flat through this region, comes up, comes down, so you get a negative peak and a positive peak here, another positive peak, and then finally you're going to where you're not going to be able to read the spectrum anymore. So that's what just your free DNA looks like. You put in the AT hook, so that little piece of peptide, you put that in, and it overlays it almost exactly in both of these, okay? And those are, that's because it's the same experiment left and right. And so, um, so it overlays. What that means is when the AT hook binds to DNA, you have none of the small molecule around, you have no dysomycin around, you can't tell that the DNA is bound by the protein. We know it is because we've run other experiments saying, yes, our conditions are correct. We know the protein is bound to it. But we can't see it by this technique. It doesn't change the structure of the DNA. Okay, so the DNA is not altered. However, let's look at the one on the left. This is dystomycin. Dystomycin, when it's bound to the DNA, it changes. This positive peak in the middle here goes up into the left some. This positive peak goes down and becomes very sort of more curved in here. And you get this whole new peak around 330. That peak around 330 is indicating that dystomycin is binding. Okay, dystomycin is not a chiral molecule, but when it binds to DNA, it shows up. Okay, so this is showing you dystomycin binding to DNA. Now, if we look at the one on the right, it looks nearly identical to this. It maybe looks a little bit lower. I'll show you uh, why it's not on the next slide or why it isn't significant on the next slide, but they look almost identical. What this is saying is dystomycin absolutely binds, but from this, we didn't know that the AT hook was no longer bound because you can't tell the difference between red and black here, okay? But what we can see is what's going on here. If we take the peak height at about 330 nanometers here and here as we add in dystomycin, we can plot that versus the amount of dystomycin added or the mole ratio. And so in blue, you have no AT hook. In black, you have AT hook. And we've just added dystomycin. And that data overlays almost perfectly. So what we, we were hoping for was we were hoping for more structural information. We went to this technique because we said, we want to know more about what's going on with this DNA. Does it look like the way it does at the start? And we see no change. And this sometimes happens in science. In fact, it happens more often than not in science, and that's part of the thrill of it, is experiments don't do what you want them to do. 
Okay, so while it's a very pretty data, it doesn't tell us much. We already knew what was going on here, okay? We get that. And so, yes, a student worked for, I don't know, a month in the summertime, four weeks to generate this data. And at the end we said, eh, okay. Sometimes it doesn't even work at all, but that is actually what a lot of the fun of science is because what you do is you persevere and then you get to stuff that works and you find the really, really cool stuff that works. But I didn't want to start out with stuff that didn't work. So I started out with the NMR. That was really, really cool stuff that told us a lot about the structure. Uh, a little bit of a side note about how science sometimes practically works and not telling you much of anything. And then we'll come back to something that worked beautifully, okay? And that is another technique called calorimetry. All right, so um, it's called isothermal titration microcalorimetry. I'm just gonna call it ITC. It's a way of measuring heat, okay? So a if you remember back to general chemistry, Q, work, heat, everything in chemistry goes back to enthalpy and entropy. We have a way of quantifying the amount of enthalpy and we do it by a technique called ITC. It's not very big. This is about the size, I used to say the size of Shaq's shoebox, it's now the size of LeBron's shoebox. It's not really the size of Lynn's shoebox, he's a relatively short basketball player. Some, on, some of you have been into the insanity. So we've got that. It's probably more the size of, of LeBron's shoebox. So it's, you know, a big shoebox. Okay. We use this eight and a half inch needle to load the chamber. Students have to walk around very carefully with this needle. It's not very pointy, but it would still be dangerous. Okay. And then we've got this little close up of this view right here. And that's part of the mixing element. Okay, because we want to make sure all this is well mixed. So if we could zoom in and look on the inside of this, this is a cartoon of what the inside of this looks like. Okay, we have two chambers, one in which our chemistry occurs, that's the one on the right. The one on the left is just a reference cell, it's what measures the heat. So what we're doing here is we're simply titrating in our small molecule, our adistomycin, and in here we have our DNA. If we have something that gives off heat, it will ex transfer that heat to the reference cell. In fact, the reference cell and the sample cell are only separated by a very thin piece of metal. Okay, they're only separated by a little bit. And so they have this little bit of transfer here. That then has sensors all the way around this and it and tells the computer, okay, I was just heated up. It sends a signal back to the system to cool back down. That's the ISO part of isothermal as it tries to maintain the temperature of the system. And then you do another titration where you add a little bit more in, you measure that heat. You do another titration, you add a little bit more in, you measure that heat. You have heat shields. This is as close as we can get in any system that anybody has ever built on Earth to a closed system. So you know that you can't possibly ever have a closed system. That's just something theoretical that we use to discuss thermochemistry. But this is as close as that we can get on Earth to keeping a closed system. So there's very little heat transfer from inside the system to outside the system. So what the data actually look like is they look like this. So if you're titrating a little bit every time, you always get this little spike that corresponds to a little bit of heat put out from the system. Eventually, it goes to nothing. That's because you have no more DNA to bind, so you have no more heat. You integrate this data, so you take the area under the curve, and you get something that looks like this. From this, we can get enthalpy. We can get delta G, so I can get our free energy. We can get our binding constant, and we can get entropy. So we get the big four of thermochemistry from this, okay? And so what we have then is, this is the one piece of experiment. I ran these, okay? Of all the data I'm showing you here today, these are the only experiments I ran, yay. All right, so everything else is done by my students. So what we did here was we varied the ratio of our AT hook from either having no AT hook or four molecules of AT hook per molecule of DNA. And we titrated distomycin. So this is what you see on the x-axis is the distomycin added. Okay? And so what you can see here is you get this down and then up. And so this is the integrated data. So each one of these, is, each one of these little points in here is just a spike where heat was given off. And then we can fit that data. So what you do is you go down and go up. That's showing that distomycin binds as a dimer, okay? Because it goes down and back up. That's because we're binding the first molecule of distomycin. 
and then you're binding the second molecule of distamides. Okay? And so as we look across here, if we look in this first one, when you have very little salt around, our cells have a lot of salt in them, that's good. And so what you see when you have no AT hook is you get a lot of heat. You get minus 10 kilocals per mole of heat given off at its max. That's a lot of heat. You add a little bit of AT hook, that gets less. A little more AT hook, less. And finally, you have 4 to 1 AT hook, and you have very little heat comparatively. Okay? You add more salt, that difference is less, but it's still there. You still, as you go from no AT hook to more, you go here. You add a lot of salt in, you see no change between the two. They both have the same enthalpic signature. They're nearly identical from here. What we can do is we can pull out the delta H's, and we're going to look at the right side first. We can pull out the delta H's for both binding of the first molecule of distamycin and binding of the second one. And so delta H1 is binding in the first, delta H2 is binding of the second one. And what we can see here is what AT hook alters, okay? What AT hook ultimately alters is it, it affects binding of the second molecule of AT hook. That was sort of surprising. We're still scratching our heads over that. Um, also, the other thing is that salt changes it. But what's really cool is this, is regardless of how much AT hook you have around, when you look at both delta H's together, and then you pull out a binding, that, remember that K cube from before the NMR where that indicates how well something binds? We get a 0.02, so that's a nice small number. That means it's binding well. You have zero molecules of AT hook around. You have four molecules of AT hook around. The same exact number regardless of how much salt you put in there, regardless of how much peptide. And we already know from NMR, we know it's bound. So we know that our AT hook was bound. We know that we're kicking it off. That distamycin binds with the same affinity. It does not bind with the same enthalpy. Okay, so we know delta H and entropy. So enthalpy and entropy combine together to give us free energy. And these are essentially a way of saying free energy here. What happens here is this is huge enthalpically, but doesn't have a lot of contrib contributions entropy-wise. So this doesn't take uh, any help from entropy. This one takes a lot of help from entropy to bind dysomycin and very little enthalpy. We get compensation, okay? So that basically, if you're getting help from enthalpy to bind, you don't have much help from entropy. If you get a lot of help from entropy, you don't get much help from enthalpy. Because of that, you get the same answer all the way through. We don't understand why, but this is something we see in biochemistry a lot. We see this enthalpy entropy compensation all over the place. We can understand it in some systems. We don't understand it here. Why would we see that so that you get the same binding constant? It's really cool, okay? What we're able to do then is bring this whole thing together, okay? All of these plus some other experiments that I didn't have time to talk with you about today and understand what's going on. So that thermodynamic data, that structural data, and we get this. And so if you start out with this, you start out with your DNA bound to your AT hook. And we have done studies with the full length protein. And so you have it bound to the DNA. You put in a, a little bit of distamycin, not a lot, but a little bit. And what you do is you set up an equilibrium here between the, the protein bound and distamycin bound. But what we have is evidence that you never get both together, okay? You throw in a little bit more distamycin and now what you can set up is a, a perfect equilibrium between the two, where you have an equal concentration of DNA that are bound to, to distamycin and DNA bound to the, uh, to the protein. You throw in a little bit more, and this guy wins. So before, the protein was winning. You throw in more, now the distamycin wins. Distamycin really wins. If you get really high concentrations, this is the only case where you might see it, but notice it's not bound here, it's bound farther away from it. So we do have some evidence that you can eventually have a little bit of that, but it's not bound in the same site, and eventually you just kick it off completely. This is really exciting. The other thing that this is saying comes back to here, is that one molecule of disomycin can kick off the entire protein. This protein actually binds in at least two, if not three sites on the DNA. But what we can do is bind one molecule of distamycin and kick off the entire protein. This will let us lower drug concentrations. That's one of the big things in the pharmaceutical industry. We want to give as little drug as possible because you lower the side effects. And so this is really exciting. We can lower those concentrations and we can kick off the entire protein. Okay, and so we're able to displace that. 
All right, so the people who have been involved in my group, this is just one of the projects in my lab. Uh, this is called the HMGA project. And so this is the long list of people who have been working on this since 2007. The work that you've seen today, Austin Smith, okay, he's, he's at Chapel Hill. Sissy Lee, she's at Johns Hopkins uh, in, at graduate school, so both of them are at graduate school. Um, Alicia is applying right now for, um, for uh, public health programs. Annalise Gorensik is applying to graduate school, and so they're the ones who you've seen a lot of this work. Cam is at the National Institute of Health in a post -bac program and applying to graduate school, and Lawrence is in medical school um, at Wake Forest, and so they've done a lot of this work. I have a catalytic DNA project, completely different. DNA can catalyze reactions. How cool is that? So you can have a DNA be a catalyst, and so we're working on that. And then uh, with my husband, who's also a chemist, um, we have a, a project that uh, he kick-started, and I'm the biochemist on this. This is my group from a couple of years ago, and so some of them are still in college with, with me, um, particularly Annalise and Julie and others have moved on to bigger and better things. But before I finish up, I also want to return to the RU program, which is how Dr. Manduma and I met. And yes, I've got <laughs> pictures of a couple of you. So this is at Furman, which is my home institution. You can see Dr. Manduma having an engaging conversation with an Australian crikey, um, Dr. Kane McGuire. So he really does say crikey. Um, and so this is outside of our office area. This is our group from last summer. So you should see a couple of faces. Uh, uh, Ayana and Shanice are, are here. But you can see that this wonderful group of scientists, which is a mixture of Furman folk and are, and are you folk, if you're interested, talk to Dr. Manduma. Okay, talk, you can feel free to send me an email. You'll find me on the firm and chemistry site if you have other questions. But you could, your face could be here from next summer's picture. It is a lot of fun. It's 10 weeks of research. It is a competitive stipend. Okay, you have to apply through a faculty member from your home institution from Albany State. But you could be here. It's a fun 10 weeks you can talk to. Uh, the, the students about last summer. They also got to do an outreach where they went to a, a basically a summer school, a summer uh, program, and they did chemistry with kids, um, first graders through third graders, and that was a lot of fun, very messy. Um, they made a great mess, a safe mess, but a great mess with these, with these kids who, and well, we made nitrogen ice cream, absolutely. So we had a, we had a great day working there. So there are a lot of fun things to do, but it's a great way to get engaged in science and do stuff like what you see here. Um, like I said, this is done by people like you sitting in seats just like you. They're just in a classroom. They didn't have class with me today. I was here, but um, sitting in seats like you guys are right now. Happy to answer any questions. So how do I target the distamycin to the specific promoters? Uh, you, you pointed to something that um, distamycin is not a good therapeutic. Okay? We're using it as a model small molecule because we could commercially buy it. Distamycin will bind any AT-rich DNA. So whether it's uh, the promoter you're interested in or a completely different promoter. So part of the project I didn't talk about was searching for molecules that are more selective, that would be able to bind two specific promoter regions. And I have collaborators that were working on that also. Absolutely. No, that's a big question. It's a big area in the field. Yeah. Yes. So yes, whether there's any known in vivo effects of adding that with, with this. Distamycin is absolutely would be toxic if you were to try to take it as a drug. I mean, you can work on it in the lab just fine. But if you were to try to ingest amounts for that so and that's because it binds so well to so many DNAs um, with things like uh, DB so where we take this answer is to other molecules and so that DB 75 that targets African sleeping sickness it was doing really well through clinical trials um, centered in Africa the problem was is that in a small population it, it, it caused kidney toxicity and so they had to pull it, so they're still refining the, the compound to try to figure out how to avoid that kidney toxicity. And so really you have to test it drug by drug. And you don't do it in humans first, you do it in, right, in, in uh, model organisms, rats and mice. If it works from there, then you move up.
So we're not to that point yet. Right now we're just at the molecular level to understand. Yeah. So the question is what other, have we done other types of experiments? For example, DNA melting experiments? And the answer is yes, we have done. DNA melting is basically where you look at, you have double-stranded DNA, but if you add heat in a controlled way, you can melt the DNA to single-strandedness, and you can get information about how well it's binding. And we have done those. I don't like those experiments as much because the binding constant changes as you change the temperature, and so you don't get a real gauge of what the binding constant is. So there are a very, when everything else fails, we use that technique. Yeah. <laughs>